Hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the second forum of the WA Coastal and Marine Community Network. We've got a really full agenda for today, so I really want to jump straight in and get things going. Uh, first of all, I find it's really useful to think about what's going to, what are we trying to get out of today? Um, so myself, Carmen, as the representative of the WA branch of the Australian Coastal Society, along with the Coastal Marine Community Network partners, will provide an overview of the network, its growth and its evolution to set the context for moving forward, um, particularly for those of you that are new to the network today. We will also provide an update on the activities that have been underway to progress the three priority areas that were identified in the first session of the coastal or the first sort of get together of the coastal marine community network back in February. And finally, to progress action in these focus areas, we're going to be asking you today to nominate yourself or another representative from your organisation to sit on the coastal marine community network working group, but there's going to be more on this later. Um, today I'm coming to you from Fremantle, so I'm sitting on Wadjuk Noongar land and I and the Coastal Marine Community Network team acknowledge the Wadjuk Noongar people and the ancestors as the traditional custodians of this land, which was never ceded and we value their connection and commitment to the land, waters and community. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from wherever you might be listening from today, paying our respect to all elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to introduce the hosts of today's forum, uh, Perth NRM, who will be represented by Hannah Gulliver, Coast Swap, represented by Joe Ludbrook, the Department of Transport, represented by Ralph Talbot-Smith, and Wallen, represented by Louise Duxbury. We're all here on behalf of the network, seeking to support more coherent and cooperative coastal community networks in WA. So while this forum is a little bit different to our last in that we're online, we still hope to try and be as interactive as possible. You will have received an email providing you with details on how we're going to hope to interact. So this involves using a program called Mentimeter, which you can access by your phone or your tablet. So just make sure you've got your phone or tablet handy. You can also access it by an additional browser on your computer if that's the easiest way for you to do so. Um, Zoom also allows interaction through a chat and Q&A function, which if you wiggle your mouse over your Zoom screen at the moment, you'll see the icons appear at the bottom of your screen. So to chat to the other participants that are here today, um, you can use the chat function. And then the Q&A function is for asking questions of the presenters. So when you're listening to the presentations, if you've got a question for the presenter, just type it into the Q&A section and we'll ask as many of those as we can at the end of the presentations. Um, as the network's a collaboration, there's lots of people that we're gonna try and hear from today. And we're seeking to provide you with information that would usually be delivered over a much longer time period than an hour and a half. Um, despite this, we're still striving to ensure that there's plenty of time for questions and interactions. So just bear with us as we navigate through this system. So to get started and to give us some practice using Mentimeter, um, we've got a couple of questions that we'd like to run through with you. So grab your phone or open a web browser and type in www.mentimenti.com. You can see this on your screen now. And then just type in the code 34797. And the code will stay at the top of your screen if you're still logging in on. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna move into our first icebreaker question. So our question is, which of these statements best describes you? So this is just a little bit of fun and to have some practice with the system. So have a read of the options there. Are you a bottlenose dolphin, always playing? A seahorse, because you support, support paternity leave? Are you coral, you like to have a community around you? Or a seagull? You're just here for the chips. Are you a humpback whale? You like jumping around and you can find, we can find you on the dance floor. So that's great. As you can see, lots of people are managing to get their responses in. It looks like most people like to have a community around them. I think that was my first choice when running through this as well. Humpback whales are coming up there. 
We've got lots of dancers with us today. And if everyone's having trouble using Menti, you can always pop a message into the chat. And you can either reach out to Perth NRM, who are the co-host, and they'll be able to answer your questions. So I'm glad to see that Coral and Humpback Whale, so we're all like a community and that we all like to dance. <laughs> a few, few dolphins and seahorses, and I'm surprised that the seagulls are so low. Okay, that's great. I think we might move on to our next question. We'd like to know what type of organisation are you with today? So we've got lots of representation from the NGO sector, which is great, and real diversity. Local government, state government, community, academic, business. And what we're gonna do at the end of the workshop, we'll send out the results for all of these questions as well. So if you find that we're moving on before you get a chance to pop in your response, please still do so. Um, and we'll be able to send out the results at the end of the forum. So if we move on to our next question. Now we'd just like to know who are you representing? Which organization are you representing today? So this is something you can type in. So this gives us all a bit of an understanding of while we still can't, might not be able to directly communicate with each other at the moment, um, just an idea of who's in the room. So we've got local governments from the city of Rockingham, great to have you, Whamsey, Perth NRM, NAC, city of Stirling, transport, and some ind individuals here as well, which is great to see. So, and we've also got Sterling Coast Care here too. So it's great to have you all with us today. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to get started with our presentations. First of all, we're going to hear from Jo Lugbrooks. Jo's a passionate coastal volunteer and practitioner, and she's also the executive officer for the Southwest and Peel Coastal Management Group. Um, jo also works as the project manager, program manager of Wulkabunin Kayaka Aboriginal Corporation and is the coastal adaptation coordinator for PMP or the Perinaturalist Partnership. Joe's has various other coastal volunteer roles, including the chairperson of the ACS or the Australian Coastal Society. So Joe's going to provide a short overview of the establishment of the Coastal and Marine Community Network and its growth since this time. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Carmen, and thanks everyone uh, for coming along today. What a great turnout. Um, I suppose the context for this presentation is that um, Coast Walk um, has quite a long legacy in working with our groups and other stakeholders on the coast um, since the mid-1990s and um, has seen a bit of a decline in the capacity of our groups and um, coastal managers across the region and a reduction um, in funding as well. 
So um, through a survey that CoSwap undertook and also a similar survey undertaken by the WA Landcare Network, it was identified that it is um, definitely the case that the groups um, are struggling and um, that some, some groups might not be, but there is a bit of a trend towards um, groups in a reduction in capacity for some of our groups. Um, at the same time, we've noticed that uh, our NRM facilitators have dropped off um, in our region uh, that we're, uh, we used to have with the Southwest Catchment Council and also the South Coast Management Group um, in, along the South Coast outside of our region um, has no longer has a similar group to CoSwap, which was the South Coast Management Group in that region. So um, CoSwap sort of realised that we like to share information and celebrate the coast, um, but that, that our efforts were becoming a little bit futile in the absence, I suppose, of that, that leadership. Um, acknowledging that the state does have a program for the coast um, through Coast West and the SIMPAP grant systems. Um, some local governments do very, very well at supporting groups and some NRM regions did manage to actually keep their coastal and marine facilitators. So um, in, in the recent past, CoSWAP has seen it very important to step outside of our, our region and our comfort zone and talk to our neighbours about um, how we might celebrate the coast and advocate for um, some buy-in by all three levels of government and some sort of structure and future for us as an organisation and for others across the state. So that's probably enough for me. Um, some of you will have heard this background twice already, so I'm quite wary of that. And some of you probably don't have any context. For those of you that don't have any context, there are um, memos and reports from the last two meetings. Um, the last meeting was in February, and the one before that was, uh, I suppose, the initiation meeting at a workshop at the State Coastal and NRM Conference um, last year in October. So that's it from me for now. Thanks a lot, Joe. Are there any questions for Joe before we move on? No, I think some of this stuff was also going to become a bit more clear as well for anyone that's a little bit unsure as we move into the presentations on the focus areas. So um, the Coastal Marine Community Network, as I mentioned, is a collaboration and the part of any collaboration is understanding what the participants would like to get out of their involvement and also what they can contribute to the network. So while we would have loved to have been able to talk this through with you directly today, given the nature of our online format and the time constraints that we're under, we sought to get some of this insight um, via the questions that you answered when we registered. So these word clouds present a synthesis of the responses that we received. So the first question was, um, what are the opportunities for you and your organisation as being part of the network and also from attending this forum? As you can see, there was real diversity in the responses. For those of you that are familiar with word, word clouds, you'll know that the bigger the word, the more frequently it was mentioned. So there really was quite diverse responses here. But the key themes included things like collaboration, sharing and receiving knowledge and information, um, good practice information to support coastal management through both the provision of that information and also the receipt of that information um, to represent your group or your sector. And there was a few people that weren't really sure that they were just, they just heard about the network and they're really interested in to see um, how it was operating and what, how it might roll out. Uh, the second question looked at this other, comp other half of that question. So um, not what you want out of it, but what can you contribute to the network? Um, it was really positive to see such, um, again, diverse responses and really positive responses with indications that the participants could share information, including data. They could share and coordinate networks. They could share information on sector-based developments, provide training, local knowledge, um, link to research and educational sectors, support coastal monitoring, and the dissemination of information to local communities. So these are really positive contributions. And as we move forward, we'll be looking for tangible ways to try and hook into the network to further progress the priority areas or the focus areas um, that we'll discuss more shortly. But first of all, we have Louise Duxbury here with us today to tell us a little bit about the WA Landcare Network and how it's supporting the Coastal and Marine Community Network. Louise is a sustainability practitioner and facilitator with 
over 30 years experience in leadership development and implementation of sustainability and environmental initiatives. Among other things, Louise is a part-time, the part-time executive officer, I should say, for the WA Lanker Network. Uh, so um, I'm here representing uh, Wong. And uh, for those who are not as familiar, WA Lanker Network is just what it says. It's a network. And when we talk about land care, we're actually talking about coast care, uh, water care, bush care, land care, and uh, friends of groups. Um, it's a very broad church and it's right across WA. So we're the, we're the only uh, peak community land and coast care organisation that exists. And there's one of us in every state and territory across uh, Australia. And we come together as the National Land Care Network. So a key role for WA Land Care Network is to consult, communicate with the members, which includes, from our perspective, all of you. Um, it's also then to advocate and represent the whole of the, of the movement in WA community organisations and so on in uh, both national and state forums um, to strengthen the capacity for uh, groups to do the work that's really desperately needed. So being able to sustain that capacity is, is really key to what we've been um, working to do. So we really formed in 2014 and we've been building since then we currently have about 130 members. It costs nothing to become a member. Every community group can do so on the WA Landcare Network website. And the reason why you might do that is number one, if you are paying insurance, which most of us now have to do, through the WA Landcare Network, there is cheaper insurance. Some of the groups report that they're able to halve their costs on, on insurance. So that's like uh, through our portal, it's a, it's a collective insurance. Um, it's also networking. So we come together now regularly on a fortnightly basis on a Zoom, which is Landcare Checks In. And we're hoping that that will be one of the offerings is that we can do some of the coastal check-ins. So if that's something that, that uh, would be useful, that we can schedule some hot topics that need to have an, an hour every fortnight, um, just having some of those really focusing coastal matters. So in our attempt to get some more resources, we've been very fortunate in the last uh, short while that the Minister McTiernan has made it possible for WA Lanka Network, along with the, all of the regional interim bodies, to apply, a, put in a proposal for a specific core funding package. So in developing up the one from WA Landcare Network, we certainly talked to the regional bodies, make sure that there wasn't overlap and that's really important to us. Um, we just recognise having talked with the um, many of you that uh, a key element is to, to come together in these sorts of networking uh, meetings and forums and webinars. And so, um, after talking with some of you, I made sure that in the package that the WA Lanka Network was putting in, we had an element in there specifically to provide ex executive officer or executive um, support. So there is a, a line item, which is a $36,000 uh, for two years running to make sure that somebody is charged and that'll be up to this organization this network to um, define uh, who will provide those services it could be any one of the community groups but it needs to be a community group and we will do as much in our normal networking we'll be putting on a full-time networker across the state as well so there we've got several ways that we're going to build that capacity for us to support um, the, the coastal work of all of the groups who are involved in this really such a critical part of our natural wonders in Western Australia. So I might just stop there and, and see if anyone has a, a question of me. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask of Louise? If you do, please remember that you just need to wave your mouse over your Zoom screen and you'll see the little Q&A box pop up at the bottom. So any questions, just pop them in there. I'll give you a couple of minutes. And of course, if we move on before you manage to type, <laughs> no problems, just flick us an email and we can direct those through to Louise. 
So as you can see, there is some really great support for the network that's coming through, um, not only from Wallen, as Louise was discussing, but also from um, a range of other groups that we'll continue to hear from as we get together. I might just, uh, before I uh, uh, mute myself, come and just say that certainly when WA Lanka Network was putting in um, a proposal from WA in as part of a federal um, collective proposal through the Pew Foundation for a conservation economic stimulus package, I included um, some key line items in there, uh, such as um, having a number of coastal facilitators being paid because I could see that that was absolutely essential and that um, that uh, capacity in Western Australia has been really gutted over the last decade in particular. Thanks. Thanks Louise. And we do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, first of all from Ray, uh, she's asked whether the, um, the positions are aspirational or already underway. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to be um, advertised very shortly as soon as I've got the ministers tick off for them, right? So they're, they're not aspirational, they're, they're, they're coming very shortly. And um, Chris has asked if there's, if I'm assuming he says, do, do you have any coastal member at the moment? Yeah, Joe Ludbrook was on the WA Land Care Committee. Yeah, and um, May has asked, Hi Louise, can you outline the support for coastal care groups that you're thinking of? Uh, well, we'll be driven by what uh, coast care groups really are, are looking for because we're, we're, that's our responsibility is to, to um, discuss whether we can help meet your needs. And, and one of the key things is to know what they are. But I guess that's why this, this sort of forum and the coastal and marine community network is so important because it's really going to be the collector of um, what, what your requirements are. And then both WA Land Care Network, regional NRM bodies and, and other, the, the agencies, local government, I think all of us need to be looking to see what we can all contribute because that's what's needed. Thanks again, Louise. Pleasure. So we'll now move on to the presentations that um, will provide a bit more detail about the three focus areas of the network. And the first one being community capacity building, the second focus area is information sharing coordination, and the third is championing for the coast or advocacy. So first up, I'd like to welcome Hannah Gulliver from Perth NRM to provide an update on focus area one, community capacity development. Hannah is an avid coastal advocate who works to protect and restore the Perth metropolitan coastline as a coastal and marine management manager with Perth NRM. Hannah is the, a co-director of environmental education organisation called EcoAction and she holds various environmental volunteer roles. She strongly believes that community connection is a key driver to conservation action. So we'll hear from Hannah right now. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Carmen. So focus area one, community capacity building. And I'm aware that building capacity spans all sectors involved in coastal management and care. So community here relates to all of us, the coastal and marine community network. Um, and from our last forum in February, there was an obvious focus on grassroots community capacity building which is a worthy focus, needs to be focused on. Um, so on the screen now, you can see there were gaps, goals, and what success would look like discussed. And these all link through. So we've already talked a bit about funding and coordination. Um, there was also a gap in strategic spatial planning. So moving into the goal, um, we wanted to see strategic direction leading to a coordinated strategic and financially sustainable approach. Um, and the next gap was succession planning, knowledge sharing, public awareness. Um, so you can see these all link into our next two focus areas of knowledge sharing and collaboration and also championing the coast. So they're all linked. Um, and capacity will be built through those two other focus areas. And in this, um, a goal would be creating standards 
for on-ground workers regarding approach, um, public participation and community engagement. This would see an increase in new volunteers. You'd have working succession plans for community groups and the flexibility through coordination to get a more flexible community engagement. So people can come off, come for one-off versus member um, events and also engage in different ways. If we move on, just explaining what capacity building means. Um, it comes at different levels. So obviously as a network today, we are increasing our network capacity moving forwards. It will allow greater collaboration, supporting one another, um, and that will flow through to community group capacity and individual capacity. It comes in different forms, and it is really dependent on region, sometimes site, and often community group. So an assessment of needs and an assessment of where we can share, where the needs are related across the WA network means that we can use funding in a more efficient way. We can share knowledge and share capacity workshops amongst the WA community. Um, so it's a really great way forwards to not only work on an individual or regional level, but to work at that network level as well. So the next slide shows the, the organisations who are already participating and contributing to this goal. Um, first of all, I'd like to zoom in on skilled volunteers. These invaluable volunteers pass on their knowledge and their experience and more and more losing a lot of that coastal facilitation um, in the past 10 years, as Louise mentioned, it means that volunteers have stepped up, also local government land managers, and there have been a few NRM regions who have diversified funding. So getting support from local government, corporate, um, sometimes fee-for-service models. So we've diversified funding, but a lot of volunteers in more regional areas have had to step up or haven't been able to have the same capacity to get that on-ground action, um, to have the skills to coordinate a group, to run a meeting, to restore their reserve. So that's where this cyclic funding um, that is competitive, it's from a small bucket, um, it it isn't as sustainable as it once was when we had federal funding. So looking forward at funding and finding an approach that will make a strategic and sustainable model is a really big step forward. And as you can see, this slide paints a, a beautiful picture of the collaborations and the amount of different organizations who are already supporting capacity in different ways and different levels from NRMs, NGOs, Landcare Network, volunteers, um, regional partnerships who already share within their region, um, government departments and in industry and academia. But with this network, we'll be able to work more cohesively and advocate for more funding to help contribute to the goal. Um, if we just move to the next slide, it shows our next steps. So we've been starting to work on these next steps, but it will be a staged approach. We need more people to take part in the network, um, and there will be more on that later about working groups. Um, so next steps. First, it was found that we should examine opportunities to increase funding for ongoing facilitation of coastal community efforts, recognising that a coordinated support is required to sustain groups' efforts and increase involvement. Um, we need to hold discussions with relevant agencies to look at updating the OSH and coastal volunteer manuals, and that has started. 
um, and we need to develop an agreed set of standards, looking at existing international standards and tools for delivery for best practice coastal management and volunteer engagement. And finally, review good practice approach approaches and techniques for grassroots community voice to be heard and included in decision making. And these all, they're big steps, but if we do them in stages, we're, we're moving forwards and they are inextricably linked to the next two focus areas as well. So thank you very much. If anyone's got any questions, shoot them through. Um, otherwise, I'll pass back to Carmen. If you'd like to ask any questions of Hannah right now, then please feel free. Um, but if we move on before you get a chance again, don't worry, we will um, still be asking questions at the end of each, all three presentations. So um, just feel free to pop them in the Q&A and just say whether they were for Hannah or Focus Area 1. That'd be great. So we, we'll move, um, being cognizant of time, straight on to the Focus Area 2, which was coordination and information sharing. Um, so there were two core elements to this theme. Um, if we want to get the presentation up now for this one. And they include coordination of effort and coordination of information. So you'll notice in the def definition of the goal of what success looks and the description of what success looks like, the focus in the first sort of forum where we all got together to discuss these three priority areas that um, a lot of attention was paid to knowledge and information management with less focus on the coordination of human resources. Um, this is something that can be given greater attention as the group moves forward. Um, and it will also obviously in part be addressed by a focus area one, which is looking at capacity building. So what does success look like in relation to coordination and information sharing? Um, the first point here focuses on coordination of effort, so seeking to share information across organisations and groups who are working on the coast, getting an understanding of what's being done, what lessons have been learned, and where capacity lies, and also how this capacity might be drawn on or further developed. And the second two points focus more on the coordination of data, and this is an aspect that Ralph's going to be speaking to very shortly. So, First of all, um, if we move to the next slide, I'll just provide a bit of an overview of some of the things that have been undertaken in relation to coordination of effort. As um, Hannah indicated, there's many groups and organisations that have already have mechanisms in place to share information across their networks, um, but a broader information sharing beyond the organisational networks is a bit more limited. So at the state level, the Australian Coastal Society has established the WA Coastal e-newsletter, which seeks to provide regular updates on the key coastal happenings within the state, um, with sections that deal with issues of governance, research and community. And this is a resource that's ready, readily available to the network to share information um, across the state. Um, mechanisms for the network to interact more directly are yet to be further developed and this is a key role for the network moving forward and it's something that we'd really like to get feedback on today. So we would like to know um, how would you like to interact with the network. There's a couple of examples listed in the slide here and we're going to ask you these questions directly a little bit later on today. Uh, you'll notice that all of the different mechanisms have different degrees of interaction and also different levels of resource and maintenance requirements. So as I said, we'll get your thoughts on these as we move forward. So in addition to these examples, Ralph's just about to discuss a potential opportunity to progress data sharing and coordination. In the long term, the structure that he, he's going to outline for you today um, may also provide the framework to expand on coordination of effort. So let's hear from Ralph. Um, Ralph is the manager of cartographic services at the Department of Transport Fremantle and is a state representative on the National Ausbed Steering Committee. Ralph has over 40 years of experience in land and seabed mapping which spans such organisations as defence, business, engineering and multiple government departments. So I'll hand over to you Ralph. Well, thanks very much Carmen. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. So uh, let me just uh, get up my presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a, a collaboration concept that I've actually come up with for the, the C, CMC in, um, um, initiative. 
but I'd like to thank uh, Joe and, and Carmen and Hannah um, for today and, and also any of those other people that have actually helped me and advised me over the last few weeks. So let's get into the presentation. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to, to start off with is, is to give you a little bit of an explanation about the responsibilities across the state. Um, we've put together this map here um, to be able to give you a bit of an understanding about what is actually happening. So when we uh, zoom in here and what we're seeing here is all of these yellow and orange areas are the actual LGA um, responsibilities for the actual coastline. So there's quite a few of those, as you can see, as we go around and go down to the south, down to the south coast. The other thing to, that I'd like you to note when we're looking at this map here is that these regional boundaries um, for the state. So these are the Regional Development Commission boundaries um, that a lot of agencies and everybody else actually use to define all regions. Um, when we actually zoom in a little bit closer to this map, um, understanding what is actually happening here, just the, the prime example is the, um, the Southwest, is we also have responsibilities from DBCA um, for the coastline in a lot of cases, but then we have a lot of partnership type situations like uh, the PNP or the Parent Naturalist Partnership um, and others such as the NAC, um, which I noticed that we've actually got some representatives here today. So there's a, that there are a lot of organisations involved in um, trying to actually help and manage and look after the coast, but there's too many to actually um, look at um, and actually be able to actually pull all together as far as I can show in this map. So my concept is predominantly around um, monitoring, I suppose. And, and data sharing and basically making, doing some really worthwhile stuff along the coast. The other thing that I'd like you to note here is that these uh, blue, green and red boundaries are what we call the geomorphological coastal compartments for Western Australia. Uh, and they are all uh, very easily indexed that they are a great division system for the actual coast. So, just, just keep that in mind as I go through and actually pop along to the next part of my presentation. Um, so when I'm talking about monitoring, um, I'm talking about photos, breach profiles, water levels, people monitoring, um, even to the extent of, of plastic and, and plastic cleanups along, along our coastline to be able to keep things up and running. So. In terms of a, an overall network, um, I've prepared this slide here to, to be able to show you um, more, more along the national lines of what's actually happening. So um, as Carmen mentioned here before, I'm actually part of the Seabed um, collaboration, which is a national collaboration to centralise all bathymetric and marine data into one central data hub. So when we actually look at this slide, uh, Hopefully we can see it quite well. A seabed covering a lot of it all. A lot of these other organisations are involved in trying to centralise data and make it easily accessible by everybody. I think the couple of things that I wanted you to look at today is the top of um, this particular diagram where we actually have things like IMSAR WA and IMSAR WA. So this is a, a, a recent initiative in Western Australia whereby all environmental approval projects that are actually now um, submitted to the EPA become open data. Um, and so I feel that the coastal and marine community network um, could actually contribute in bridging the gap between IBSA and IMSA. IBSA is the land environmental approvals and IMSA is the sea or the marine ones. Um, so I'm trying to actually outline to you here sort of like a bigger picture type scenario with regards to data sharing. So when we go on to the next slide here, what I'm, this is what I'm actually pro proposing, um, is that potentially we actually have a larger collaboration organisation whereby we have a number of um, government departments and organisations that are actually advising people in the regions about potentially what needs to be done in particular coastal areas. And then I'm talking to, in terms of monitoring, all of our coast is very, very diverse, whether you go from the north to the south. So I'm looking at transport, um, DBCA, lands, 
NRM, everybody else actually working as a coastal working group to try and actually make some decisions about what needed to be done in particular areas. And then that potentially would actually feed down into the regional coordinators. So you remember the regional boundaries that I showed you, the, the regional coordination team would, could potentially hold somewhere like a coordinator, an admin officer, a data officer to be able to actually process all of the monitoring data that is being fed back up through the system. An LGA liaison officer to be able to making sure that LGA's needs and, uh, and, and, and concerns are met. And also an Indigenous liaison officer to be able to, to, to actually deal with that side of things as well. So those coordinators or those teams would then actually be responsible for a primary compartment supervisors. And these in turn would actually manage teams in the tertiary and secondary compartments in terms of uh, making sure that, uh, sorry about that, that the photo, they are the ones that will actually do the monitoring, sediment samples, observations, et cetera, and be able to feed that through. So how would that actually work? Um, I envisage that this would be a sort of a prime example whereby where we had a teams in the Great Southern taking photographs of the beaches, sediments and observations and feeding them up through the regional data manager. An analogy of this is that we had a, a very big storm here in WA on the 25th of May. Um, it actually, the Department of Transport actually had to send out people to take photos um, of where the storm damage was most severe. I can foresee a, a structure like this whereby um, we would actually put a call out through this network that I, I showed you in the previous slide and everybody would actually take photos of their responsible areas and pump that back up into a central uh, hub type system. So the next slide is really showing all of that actually happening. So all of that monitoring type data coming up into a cloud hub scenario. And then from that people, uh, organizations or consultants or whatever, will be able to take that data and be able to actually do analytics and processing put it into web formats and make it available online for people to be able to access. But then that also deals across here into the larger national picture um, and feeding into one central repository for all of this data so that we can capture once and actually use many times. So this is the, the concept that I'm actually coming up with. I think a really important part of this as well, we could also use this cloud type scenario to be able to push education back down to teams so that they can actually start to understand the individual coastal processes that are actually happening in their particular patch. Um, okay, so what does this mean? So monitoring and activities. I think it could probably make volunteering for our groups much more attractive and meaningful. Um, there'll be a lot of things, there'll be a lot of skills needed to be able to actually make something like this happening. Um, photography, data management, all sorts of technology uses, as well as all of the things potentially that you're actually doing now as well. We're trying to try and make this data open data. Um, and so under the Creative Commons scheme, and then there will also be the ability then to train people to do specific things, which is something that actually came out of the, the, the last workshop that we had. Um, and then, so there'd be multiple uses for this data as well in terms of monitoring. It wouldn't just be coastal management, it will be environmental, it will be people management. There's all sorts of different streams that we could actually, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So what I, last couple of slides here is, we, there is already an example of this actually happening in Australia at the moment, and this is actually in Victoria. Um, so uh, Dan Irikadakadu, um, has, he probably is watching with us today, but he's quite willing for me to uh, use a couple of his slides. He, he's a manager of a Victorian program very similar to what we're actually, what I'm actually advertising to you today. So the Victorian Coastal Monitoring Program, they've been going for nearly two years now. Um, and so they're quite a bit ahead of the game in terms of where we are in Western Australia in terms of this collaboration type scenario. What are they actually doing? Well, they're actually utilising drones. They're training people in their usage. 
they're using such an extent that they're actually able to survey their bits of the coast. They are actually, you can see this movie here, they're making 3D models, using that 3D models to actually do analysis of their coast. Um, there's a huge amount of, of work um, involved. Um, they've got somewhere in the vicinity of 14 or 15 sites currently working with plans to actually expand this out. Um, this, I think the most important thing here is the bottom right hand corner. This is the collaboration of all of these groups into this one focused area, trying to actually look after the coast. So that's really, really important. Um, and so in conclusion, this is one of his slides that he presented to New South Wales, which looks like they're gonna go down the same path. They're using UAVs, citizen science, people are getting trained. Um, that information is flowing back. Um, but the critical part here is the, the saying on the right hand side, data is the key for us to understand our coastlines. And this is the sort of thing that I'm actually proposing. So thanks very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'll hand you back to Carmen now. Thank you. Well, you can hold on there for a second, Ralph, because we have a couple of yep. questions. <laughs> yep. So everyone else, if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A and I'll make a start now. Um, so Gary has asked, does Oz Seabed collect the coastal monitoring data from local governments? No, not at the moment. Um, we're, we're just trying to concentrate on getting uh, survey information from all of the different survey companies in Australia, whether that, and, and also the, the government agencies in Australia. Um, it's a huge task. We've got somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to about 50 collaborators already. We've been going also for two years. Um, we're just building the, the cloud hub at the moment, um, and that'll probably be ready in the next six months. That'll allow people to contribute survey data, but it'll also allow people to be able to actually extract data um, and be able to actually use it for whatever is needed, whether that be private enterprise, government, um, universities, whatever. Thanks, Ralph. And I've got a question, uh, two questions from Nancy here. Um, DOT yep. Coastal Management Unit uh, requested LGs to provide photos of damages yep. caused at their boundaries and have you access to this data was part one. And the next part, she's she mentions there's extensive coastal monitoring information available at various councils. Is yep. Department of Transport capable of collecting all information which is already done as part of the CAP grant process? Right, so I've been involved with this as well. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we want to go down the collaboration path. The management of that data is quite a big job. And as you local government would know, you probably don't have the resources to do it. And to some degree, transport probably doesn't as well. But in the collaboration sense, if we can actually agree, there are a lot of uh, processes and methodologies we can use to be able to ensure that, that the local governments can manage the data, but we can actually make it readily available to other people if they want to go down that path. And that's potentially using a cloud-based solution, something like I've actually suggested before in the presentation. Thanks, Ralph. Um, and from Meg, she says, hello, Ralph, a fantastic concept. Both Cambridge at Coast Care and Flurry at Surf Life Saving Club took photos of their beach erosion following winter storms so far. I think that's more of a, a comment. Um, yeah. And from Carolyn, Ralph, your collaborative model is based on streamlining government monitoring processes and mechanisms. How will community coast care groups be integrated into this model? Uh, basically, as far as I can see, we can actually utilise their skill sets. Um, the, one of the things that came out was that people wanted to be trained, that there is the, the probably the misconception that we hold a huge amount of data already. Um, we struggle. Um, it's such a big state. Um, that's why we're trying to uh, suggest that we go down this collaborative process to try and work together to actually build these things. And, and that working together means continued monitoring in particular locations that is actually organised and actually standardised as well. And that's, that's some of the problems with the data that we're actually seeing today. Thanks. Um, another question, Ralph. Would this be a worthwhile? Um, would it be worthwhile approaching IMOS, IMOS, or NCRIS? I'm not sure of the acronym. Yep. Sorry for funding. That's okay. Um, 
So Dan and I have been talking about, uh, Dan in Victoria and I have already been talking about IMOS and, and I think that uh, there are people actually going down that path. I haven't been specifically um, talking with them, but I know that they are very interested in, in this sort of con community engagement, which is what we're proposing today. Yes. Um, someone has asked if we can clarify the abbreviations that I've just pronounced. So we had IMOS, what does that stand for? Integration Marine Observing System. And NCRIS? Oh, um, INCRIS is, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, acronyms in Canberra are so, you know, abundant that I, I can't even keep up with them all. I, I know I know what INCRIS does to some degree, and I know our CVET is probably directly related to them. So a lot of our people in the collaboration that are in Canberra are actually dealing with a lot of these organisations as well. Oh, here we go. Someone's just posted it for me. National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Yep. Yep. And just to note as well, Nancy's also made the comment that the City of Wanneroo has an aerial beach survey program up and running, which has been going since 2018 and will continue for another five years. Um, yep. And I think that that's a good point, that there are lots of local governments and lots of community groups undertaking a lot of work at the moment. But I suppose the value in the system that Ralph has been talking about is being able to coordinate or sort of collectively compile that information so that it can be available more broadly as well. Yep. That's and exactly in, right. In a, in a, yeah, a way that the information is systematic across the systems. And, and this is just from the organisations that are here with us today. There are a lot of organisations that aren't here that I know have also got data. Um, it's a matter of knowing what they've got and, and when they've actually acquired it and being able to actually somehow provide a mechanism to make it available to people if that's what they wish to do. Okay, and one last one, Infrastructure Western Australia. Is there a way that they could be involved in this um, as they're providing strategic direction for port structures, et cetera? Is this, is this the PNC group? I'm not too sure. Uh, infrastructure WA is all it says, I'm not too sure. Uh, look, I think, I think so. Um, there's definitely a benefit, there could potentially be a benefit to them. Um, there is a lot of data about infrastructure, particularly along the coast, and, and I know transport has already got a lot of this, so uh, there's too much information. Uh, I'd like to be able to talk to you about this soon. If you'd like to talk to me, oh, not Piank, okay. Um, if you'd like to uh, contact me, um, then please, uh, by, all, uh, by all means, do so after, and we can talk about this after. And two last questions. Um, one from Gary asking is whether the data collection methodologies are standardised across disciplines to avoid duplication and the over collection of data? Um, as far as I know, no. Um, and that's one of the aims of this collaboration process. Yeah. And finally from Meg, uh, in the meantime, Ralph, do we hold on to our beach erosion photos until your concept is in place? Definitely, yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks very much, Ralph. Okay, thanks very much, Carmen. And um, if you've got more questions, please feel free to keep them coming. We can ask any at the end if we still have time. So finally, I'd like to hand over to Joe. He's gonna provide an update on team three, um, being a champion for the coast um, and advocacy. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Carmen. Um, I might just ask Perth NRM to pull up a screen. I might save a little bit of time here. Um, I'm going to keep it quite short and punchy, even though there's a lot of words in front of you on your screen. Um, again, uh, apologies for those that have seen this before. And if um, I'm a little bit robotic, because my internet is a little bit unstable here today. Um, but we've tried to um, obviously stick to positive language. I think sometimes, I suppose, a way to divide us and, and see our differences. But in this particular case, we're really just talking about how we can um, agree on different areas that we need to progress for better outcomes for the coast. So how can we work together for better outcomes for our coast and coastal communities? And um, there is a fair, quite a number of gaps that we've identified um, in previous forums and um, as well as other groups have identified similar gaps um, across WA 
Um, data, obviously, data management, obviously, being a big one, and capacity building um, being a big one too, um, having that reduction there. Um, so what I've got here in front of me, uh, what you've got here in front of you are, I suppose, goals. Um, and um, I'll just give an example of what we think success might look like, which I think us all being here today is a great example of success. Um, getting together and sharing information and trying to come to some level of understanding um, about what we might need for better outcomes for that long-term vision for the coast. Um, so consistency, um, we've, we've already touched upon, um, cross-regional networking, all those different regions and those lines on maps, um, ongoing support and resourcing for coastal volunteers. We've seen in the past intergovernmental agreements work really, really well to um, provide that mechanism for community groups to have a voice at the table. Um, again, it's similarly a statewide level of advisory role for, um, for communities and holders sitting at table that converse statewide making. Uh, we're seeing um, the, the manual needing updating. I, I think it was updated. Um, we'd love to see that more, less competitive, more ongoing funding for um, our coastal areas. It's one that comes up again and again, as we all know. But yeah, obviously the um, couple of those big ones that come up again and again is the lack of legislation in Western Australia as well. So I just asked to go to the next slide there. So in the um, survey, uh, we'll, we'll go back to probably after this presentation, we'll ask a bunch of questions of you. And I thought this is probably a good opportunity to, for you all to have a think about um, advocacy and, and what you might want to champion as an individual, um, what your own organisation needs are and, and how you might advocate um, at that level and what we might as a group see is something that we can some of those low-hanging fruit items that we all agree on that we could advocate together so um, the idea here is to realize that uh, we're not going, going to be able to do everything and it won't happen overnight um, but we do have now have a platform and a mechanism to have the conversation and that's a really great start so for me um, this is success we're, we're all here together um, we're in a very contested space along the coast and um, you know, I can imagine um, a conflicted space um, for all sorts of reasons. But what we might realise is that there are a few really, really clear areas um, that we can all work together for that collective input. And there's some things that we probably won't be able to do collectively where we, we might not agree in the future. So I suppose it's just a way of framing um, the future and sort of saying to you all that as long as we trust in the process and be respectful of one another, we really can um, do some great work together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, does anyone have any questions for Joe before we move on? I think you'll notice that Joe posed some questions for you as opposed to <laughs> us having questions for her. So, what we might do, um, thanks for all the great questions and comments. I can see that there's um, there's lots of things that we would really like to discuss, which would obviously be a lot easier um, in person where we can have a more face-to-face -face dialogue. And we really hope that this will happen um, sometime soon in the future. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much for posting your questions now. And um, what we would like to do now is have some questions for you. So if you look back at Mentimeter, you'll see that we have questions relating to the three presentations that you've just heard. Uh, we would like to run through these relatively quickly. So if you could get your phones or web browser or whatever it is that you're using to access Mentimeter up and ready. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna run through these questions and we'll send through the output to all of the participants after the forum. So, and importantly, your answers are going to help provide a tool to support ongoing planning and development under each of the three themes that you've just heard from. Um, if anyone's having any difficulty um, using Mentimeter, please post a, a little message in the chat room and Perth and Aaron might be able to help you so that you can ensure that your comments and inputs are popped in there too. So we'll jump onto our 
first question, and we're thinking about the theme of capacity building. So back to Hannah's discussion and presentation, we've got a couple of questions for you. First of all, um, do you use the current WA Coastal Volunteer Manual? And when we say current, it is actually, um, it's, it's quite old, so it was produced over 10 years ago, but it is the current manual in place at the moment. You see that lots of us aren't aware that there's a manual. <laughs> Sorry, we're just waiting for a few more responses and then we'll move on to our next question which is still linked to this. Oh, no, it's not, sorry. Great, so our next question is, have you ever read the WA Coastal Strategy? Simple yes or no for this one. And our next question links back to the WA Coastal Strategy. Um, if you have used it or read it, did you find it useful? Okay, I think that's most of our yeses have responded. So we'll give you a couple more minutes, seconds, sorry, not minutes. <laughs> Great, and our final question in the capacity building section is who do you go to for support in capacity building? So in relation to your role on the coast, you're seeking capacity building, who do you go to to access this, these capacity building? support and this is something that you can write in um, so just type in your response when you're ready So we've got really diverse sources for capacity building, which is great. So just like Joe, um, Hannah was mentioning at the front, there's lots of different areas or sources of support for capacity building. I know some people are a bit unsure, which is fine. So we've got people heading to LGAs, uh, NRM groups, funding bodies. So lots of us are seeking funding to support our capacity building. The universities, research organisations. Yeah, internal as well, which is great to see. People accessing capacity through their own internal organisations. I'll leave it there for a few more seconds, see if we get any late entries, yeah. Yeah, some people accessing experts based on specific skills that are required. Government departments, again, universities, uh, NRM groups. Great, thanks a lot, everyone. So we'll now move on to the theme of collaboration. 
And our first question here is, how do you currently connect with your peers? So again, this is a, a written response. This could be face-to-face -face telephone, emails, newsletters. Yep, Facebook, right? Um, and if it's newsletters, do you mind letting us know which sort of news, what sort of newsletters? Facebook groups, social medias, looking big. As to his direct communication, through emails and phone calls, etc. I noticed the Coast Swap forums as well. It's a useful way for people to connect. All right, so it looks like we're largely connecting through our personal connections, through emails and phone and face-to-face -face, and also using um, social media through different Facebook groups, um, LinkedIn and signing up to forums and newsletters. Okay, I'll just see if there's any more questions, but responses coming in before we move on to our next one. Okay, next question. How would you like to interact across the network? So there's a couple of options here. You can choose whether you'd like to interact remotely or face-to-face -face, uh, or both, or whether you want formal or informal. Just bring this on. Oh, sorry, we've got this as a, sorry, a, a text response. Is anyone able to put a response in here? Yep, we've got a couple of things. Okay, so we've got people liking to interact via newsletters, face-to-face -face forums, conferences, a combination of remote and face-to-face, -face, um, informally. People talking about informal with open access as well. Yeah, I think this, that was a great comment, mixture of both, having both informal and formal opportunities where people can get together to meet people and then connect outside of those formal forums. And some comments here about the importance of formalizing data management requirements, which is great. Linking back into a focus area two. Yeah, a nice suggestion here about coming together annually, um, perhaps linking to the coastal conference and having more regular working groups that interact. Okay, and a couple, we'll leave it for a minute more, see if we get any more responses. Forums and MS, MMS Teams, I think we're all quite getting quite used to using things like Zoom and Teams at the moment, aren't we? Although, looks like Women WA might be coming out the other side. Great. Thanks very much for your responses. We'll move on to our next question. So this is building on what we just said then, but we're just looking at 
preferences for informal, formal, or both. We did get a bit of a taster for that if you just want to quickly select one of the three. <laughs> Looks like both is a hit, which makes sense. Obviously, we need these formal networks and meet gatherings, um, but then the ability to interact informally outside of the formal situations is really important as well. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Um, again, remotely, in person, or both? Yeah, again, obviously, both. I think this is really all coming clear from the the more t the text responses you put in, so this is great. Okay, and we've got two more questions for the collaboration theme. The next one being, can you envisage your group being part of the statewide data hub collaboration as suggested? Oh, wait a minute, sorry. Interaction frequency, I missed one. <laughs> How regularly would you like to have for um, interaction with the group. Yeah, quarterly is dominating. And then again, this doesn't mean that we're going to be stuck to one of one of these. Um, the, the think depending on the modes of interaction that we're adopting, there'll be the opportunities to um, interact more frequently depending on the approach that we're using. More informally, sort of on a quarterly or annually basis, quarterly or annual basis. Okay, so this is the question I was jumping to. Um, would you like to be part of a collaborative statewide data hub, as Ralph has suggested? This is a simple yes or no. Are we going to get any more responses? Yeah, a few. A clear yes, which is great. Not quite clear. We do have one no, which is all good. And I notice there's a few people that aren't responding. If you're having problems with Mentimeter, that's not a problem. Um, we can feel um, just reach out to us. I'd be more than happy to send these questions to you by email if you would like to have the opportunity to respond and you're not quite managing to do so on the interactive Mentimeter that we've got going at the moment. So the next question, do you have another big picture idea for the network? So what we've heard from today is a couple of initiatives that are currently underway. And I guess you could see Ralph's um, proposal, which we would see as a sort of a big picture, long-term um, proposal for the network. This is an opportunity for you. Um, just on the spot, no pressure, to have a think about if you've got any big picture ideas that you think the network could work towards or strive towards. And again, I realise this is, you know, perhaps putting everyone on the spot. Feel free to pop anything down. Yeah, CoSnap for WA, that sounds like a great idea. That's one way to sort of intro, um, collect some of that information on a broader scale, expanding it beyond the PMP region, which is currently being piloted or implemented. Yes, updating the statewide manual, a Coastal and Rain Act, yet. Yeah. A community developed coastal code. That's a really interesting one. I like that. Statewide coastal festival of activities. Yep. Yeah. Capacity building workshops and awareness raising. Great. Seeking more funding for coastal management.
Yeah, that's great. All right, so and again, feel free to keep these big picture ideas coming where um, the network is, as we keep coming back to a collaboration. So the more input and support that we get from you as a network participants, um, the, the more benefit that we're all gonna get out of the network itself. So getting more members to contribute, whoop, that one just jumped away from me. A snapshot of how each of the coastal OGAs, oh, these things, they keep jumping before I can read them. I'll let you read them yourself. <laughs> but we're getting some great ideas, which again, we will manage to keep um, um, collate and we can send through to everyone at the end of the forum. Okay, we jump on to our next theme. We've got championing for the coast and a couple of questions under there. Um, feel free to keep entering your response into the big picture idea if you're still going. I'll leave it actually, sorry, there are some responses still coming through, so we'll leave it for another minute or so. Yeah, the coast is considered a community asset and so should be funded by the community above the LGA. That's a really interesting and um, position to put it forward. I, I like it. Collaborative coastal studies. Yeah. Get more members to contribute to the Atlas of Living Australia, which is a really amazing resource as well. Another 20 seconds before we move on. Some examples coming out of Victoria, which are great. Okay, so the last set of questions that we've got for you are in relation to championing for the coast. So our first question, do you feel like your local community understands coastal issues. Yeah, the majority of us are looking like, I feel like there's probably not quite a strong enough understanding of like coastal issues within our communities. Okay, great. And the next question that we'd like to ask is, this is the question that was raised by Joe earlier. Um, what issues do you think are most important to advocate for as an individual? And so remembering that we'll come up to our different scales. So first of all, this question is considering what you would advocate for as an individual. Next, we'll ask you about the, at the organisational level, so within your organisation. And then finally, um, the third question will be focusing on, you know, what the, the network itself might champion. So this is at the individual level, what would you like to advocate for? Yeah, so positive outcomes for your local area, which is great, more funding, yeah. Demonstrating the human impacts to coastal areas, yeah, and community awareness raising. Monitoring data storage. I like the little campaign slogan that someone's put up, don't be a douche, respect your coast. OK, 
Okay, looking for biodiversity protection, looking again at climate change impacts, raising awareness of the importance of the coast, consistent funding, long-term funding, funding, funding. <laughs> yep, better um, litter management, protection of vegetation, human impacts, these are great. Understanding of the coastal dynamics. Yeah, getting closer to our communities. Okay, that's great. So let's move on to our next one. What would you, um, what issues do you think are important for your organisation to advocate for? So again, funding, um, indigenous knowledge in coastal management, it's great. Feral animal control, community capacity building, uh, low impact engineering solutions to support revegetation. Lots of um, information seeking more um, Sorry, lots of suggestions for advocating for more technical expertise in relation to coastal dynamics. So understanding our coast a bit better. Looking for economic opportunities through offset linkages. Um, more climate change funding support, community engagement on the results of monitoring and research. I think that's really important that the community is going to be involved in being more passionate about our coast. They really need to understand it and be provided with information about what's happening. Okay, we'll move on to our final question for this section. What issues should the network champion collectively? Remembering that we're here from very diverse um, backgrounds, sectors, organisations. Um, but as Joe mentioned, there are areas in which we can collectively present a united voice. Um, so what, what do you think that the network should be looking for? Yeah, so the big picture ideas, great suggestion, which we're really appreciative of receiving all these big picture ideas as well. More funding. Yep, data sharing. Data and evidence-based policy and decision-making. Yeah, all right. Sharing resources. championing for the sustainable management of our coast and for a better understanding and care of the coast. That's great. Consistent messaging, that's really important as well. I really like that one. The importance of Engaging the community with the big picture strategies. Yeah, biodiversity conservation. 
um, addressing climate change again, building resilience to climate changes. Celebrating our coastal and marine resources. And these are great suggestions. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your responses. I'm going to leave this um, running while I keep talking. <laughs> so just for another minute or two, and then we'll close it off. So we're now moving towards the close of the forum. So keep your phone handy because we're going to have one more Mentimeter session, which is going to allow us to capture perhaps what might be the most important element discussing our next steps. Um, to make real progress on the prior er, priority areas and to be able to refine those priorities moving forward, the network really requires a coordinating committee or a working group that can regularly meet to progress different priority areas. So at the moment, this has sort of been um, informally let, um, been delivered by the Australian Coastal Society, Coast Swap, Perth NRM, um, UWA and Department of Transport. But I think moving forward, we need to sort of start moving towards a more formalised working group. So to facilitate this process, there's going to be a couple of stages through which we'll travel. First of all, we'd like to gauge from you, our network participants, your interest in being part of the Coastal Marine Community Network Working Group. Um, it's anticipated that we're going to have probably one or two representatives from the different sectors, community, research, NGO, private sector, local state government, etc., who can be the voice for their sector bringing information to the working group um, and sharing information from the working group across their sector. So it's anticipated that the working group will probably um, meet regularly, uh, whether that's um, online or in person will obviously vary. Um, and then they'll report to the broader network on a quarterly or six monthly basis. So to start this process, please look at Mentimeter again. Um, these answers, your answers to these questions are not going to come up on the screen. Um, these are private responses. So the first question asks about your interest in being part of the working group and which themes you'd be interested in. And please note that you can be, um, can choose multiple, multiple groups, so multiple themes. So for, um, we're popping in your name and email address so that we can contact you post the forum if you would like to be involved. And as you can see, we've got four options, the management advisory group, which would sort of be the overall Coastal Marine Community Network working group. And then there'll be sub themes that are gonna be working potentially on each of the three focus areas. So you've got the advocacy or championing the coastal group, um, the collaboration, group, which is looking at information sharing, the data management component. And then we've got the capacity building group, which is referring to the um, capacity building initiatives that Hannah was talking about at the start of the presentations. So I'll give you a, a few minutes to pop your details in there if you're interested. And again, if we move on too quickly, um, please let me know. I'm aware that it's 2.30 and we're very close to finishing. So I will um, quickly get through these questions. And if you feel like you've missed out, just let me know and I can, um, we can follow up with you directly. Okay, so our next question is, is there anyone from your, or can you share, can we share your name, organisation and interest in joining any of the working groups with the network more broadly in an update? So just let us know whether you'd be happy for your um, 
name an organisation to be shared and potentially which working group you would put yourself against. Um, again, we're not going to show the results for this at the moment, just yes or no. Okay, that's great. Um, and finally, is there anyone from your sector whom you would like to nominate as a valuable person to have on the working group? We're um, aware that we are not necessarily going to have everyone that um, might be interested in sitting on the working group at this forum today. So if there's anyone that you think um, might be interested or someone that we should reach out to, uh, please let us know. So just pop in a, a name and maybe contact detail, email address, or just a name and organisation, and we can follow that up. Okay, that's great. Uh, once again, if there's, um, if we move on before you're finished, just reach out. Okay, guys. Well, thank you very, very much for being with us today and your involvement in the forum. I look forward to growing the network with you as we move forward. Um, a recording of the forum will be sent out to all the participants once it's available. And we'll also be sending through the results of um, the Mentimeter responses. Feel free to share um, the information across your networks. Now, if you have any other questions, feel free to stay online. Otherwise, thank you once again for joining us. Um, we really hope you've enjoyed this process and hopefully our next forum will allow us to physically get together. Thanks again from the team um, and goodbye. <laughs>